So, you know, we, we mentioned Doppler before, and just, you know, a few words about uh, Christian Doppler. He's from Salzburg, Germany. He uh, died in 1853. Interestingly, he was supposed to be a stonemason, but didn't quite have the strength for that. And so he studied mathematics and astronomy, uh, became professor of physics at the University of Vienna, where he formulated the Doppler effect, which, as you know, has lots of different applications these days, including GPS, weather forecasting, and radar guns. Um, he read his paper in 1842 concerning the colored light of double stars. And every time I see that, it just sort of reminds me of a Pink Floyd song or an album. It just, you know, it's so psychedelic. Um, and he described fluctuations in the frequency of sound or light when there is motion between the source and the eye or ear of the receiver, which is the basis of flow and measurement. And I can't imagine he has any idea how we use that these days. It would, comp it would definitely blow his mind. So let's go ahead and talk about the renal and mesenteric evaluation. I will speak first in general terms about how to optimize the exam. And then I will go into the specifics for each exam. And then we'll do the same questions at the end of the presentation. So what I'm going to do is talk about optimization. We'll talk about criteria and protocols. Um, and hopefully that will improve the quality in the interpretation of the studies that you do. So of course, these are challenging studies, um, really, really more challenging, I guess, for the sonographer, because they're the ones who have to present that data to you uh, and make sure that it's in a format that you can interpret. And so obviously, using the best equipment with harmonic imaging, I find very, very important to improve the quality of the study. Of course, the other key element here is getting the right views. And I call these money views, and I show these to my sonographers right away when they do these studies. Once they're able to get these views, obtaining the data is relatively straightforward. They know to change the position of the patient from one decubitus position to the other, uh, sometimes even going coronal for the, for the renal arteries. Um, to get those views. And you can see here is a look at the right renal artery. And the way we get the right renal artery in its entirety is by scanning through the liver, turning the patient up. And you can see the renal artery in this patient in its entirety. And so it's just a matter of dragging the sample volume from, its, from the origin, from the aorta, into the hilum of the kidney to get all the information on that side. Of course, if you optimize the color Doppler and you see a nice homogeneous pattern like that, you know that there's no stenosis. But that requires adjusting your color gain or your PRF so that you would see a stenosis. Um, and here again, renal vein, renal artery, very well seen. For the left kidney, again, it's essentially just turning the patient left side up and using the kidney as your window, and as I'll show you in a second, able to see it uh, extremely well. For the mesenteric arteries, a little more challenging because of the fact that you tend to go midline. You can adjust the, you know, the, the perspective and where you try to find the abdominal aorta and the branches coming off, but we tend to use a longitudinal approach for those. And that requires having less bowel gas, which is why we fast the patient prior to the study. So again, as I mentioned to you, adjusting the color gain, the PRF and the wall filter are really key. Adjusting it for that patient, very important. Um, here's another look at the right renal artery. Again, very well seen. No aliasing, no flow disturbance. So we have a really good idea that there's no underlying stenosis even before we get our Doppler velocity measurements. Here we also notice in this particular case there's early branching of the renal artery. Nice to see the anomalies right away. Uh, by Adjusting your PRF and looking for flow disturbances, you're able to easily see aliasing when it occurs. And here's an example here of focal aliasing at the origin of the left renal artery, which tells you there is likely a stenosis there, particularly when it's uh, paired with a color brewery artifact. Um, other things to optimize, making sure the sample volume is relatively small. Okay, and here we're looking at the sample volume. In the mesenteric artery, again, small, so it's just in the lumen. You're not getting conflicting signals, overlapping waveforms. Angle correction, always have to make sure it's 60 degrees or less. And make sure when you record those waveforms that you record the whole waveform and you're not aliasing everything. You want to increase your PRF so you can include the waveform on your tracing. Normal waveforms. Okay, obviously, when, whenever we talk about a, a different application, most important is recognizing normal. 
We talked about carotids before. Have to recognize normal velocities, need to know normal waveform shapes. That's how you determine pathology. Even if they miss the lesion, you can sometimes infer the pathology because the waveforms have changed. They're no longer normal. When we talk about the celiac, the renal arteries, they provide blood flow to those high metabolic organs. The liver, the spleen, like the brain, demand continuous forward flow throughout the cardiac cycle. So you expect to see lots of forward diastolic flow. No flow reversal. When we talked about the carotid before, lots of forward diastolic flow. There should always be forward diastolic flow. Same with the celiac, same with the renal and the proximal aorta that provides blood flow to those vessels. And we contrast that with the mesenteric arteries, the SMA and the IMA, which are high resistance in the fasting state. So we see little diastolic flow and sometimes a little bit of flow reversal on those waveforms. And that's exactly what we see in the distal aorta because that's distal aorta is providing blood flow to the extremities. And we, as we'll see in some of our other cases today, high resistance flow, triphasic waveforms are the normal flow pattern in the peripheral arteries. So it doesn't matter what type of Doppler study that we're doing. The approach remains the same. When we talked about the carotids earlier, we talked about looking for plaque, looking at the color pattern, looking at velocities and waveforms. It's really the same thing. Optimizing the image so you can see the plaque allows you to tell right up front whether you expect that there's going to be a stenosis or not. A lot of plaque in the aorta, particularly near the osteo of the vessels, really clues you in that there's probably some disease there. And then it's just a matter of getting the rest of the information, putting your clues you. Win that there's probably some disease there. And then it's just a matter of getting the rest of the information, putting it on your color, looking for the flow disturbances, and sampling where you see abnormal flow. Some quick examples here, you know, looking at the renal artery, seeing plaque, even here it's relatively hypoechoic plaque, good resolution, seeing the plaque, seeing the narrowing, even before you put the color on, allows you to make a determination there's going to be something there. And also looking for other things, looking for evidence of dissection, looking for a flap, looking for fluid around the aorta, looking for other things that are abnormal like an aneurysm, all important parts of the exam. Turn the color on. And here in this case here, we can see that there's stenosis in the celiac artery, there's narrowing, there's aliasing. Like I said, with a high grade stenosis, you'll see color brewery artifact. And it allows you to be fairly certain you have an abnormality, yeah, usually flow reducing lesion. If it's occluded, you optimize it, look for the absence of flow. And you can also look for collateral vessels, which confirms to you, again, that there's a problem there. When you see the collaterals and no flow in the main vessel, clearly then that means that it's occluded. The criteria, just like with the carotid, we say the main velocity criterion, the peak systolic velocity is where we start. But we augment that with, by looking at the ratio and by looking at the waveforms. And I find that by combining those, you really have a high accuracy. It's the same principle. Don't rely just on the numbers. Put the whole picture together. You've looked at the grayscale. You've looked at the color. Now you have this other, these other features that will confirm for you that it's a significant stenosis. By combining that information, you're going to have a very high accuracy. In general, for the celiac, for the IMA, for the renal, we use a velocity cutoff of 200 centimeters per second. The only exception is the, the SMA, where 275 works better. Bear in mind, as we said before, velocity cutoffs don't work for all patients, particularly very old patients or very young patients. As we said before, younger patients typically have no, normally high velocities that may be surpassing the threshold. Very old patients with cardiac disease may have relatively low velocities, which may not make the cutoff for you to decide it's a significant lesion. Which is why we like to incorporate velocity ratios. When you have very high flow or very low flow, the ratios can help you in those situations. And when that ratio is greater than three to one or four to one, then you can now start to be very suspicious. It's flow reducing. And the icing on the cake are these post-stenotic waveforms. You know, this shaggy waveform, that sort of uh, picket fence appearance that you get in a post area is the confirmation that it's flow reducing. 
We see these distal to just about every significant stenosis. We say it's bidirectional because, as I mentioned before, when those red blood cells come spilling out of the stenosis, they're moving at different velocities in different directions, giving you that chaotic appearance. So, you know, some people call it shaggy picket fence. My friends at Cleveland Clinic call it Bart Simpson hair. You know, it all looks the same. And in general, they tend to have very low velocities because as they shoot out, not only are they losing energy, they're losing pressure and they're losing velocity. So you can go from a very high velocity waveform in the stenosis to this turbulent low velocity waveform in the post-stenotic space. Now we also mentioned tardis parvus waveforms and that's that slow rise to systole that we see in the post area. Now this is typically a little bit further down from that post signal. The post signal is that, is that shaggy one. And if you go further downstream, then you start to see that the, the red blood cells start to reform that flow pattern, but it has that slow rise to systole. And you learn to recognize that. Um, you can do that by calculating acceleration time or acceleration index. But in general, I just have my sonographers and my docs look at the waveforms. I want them to, to look for that TP shape, and when they see that, then they know that it's a tardis parvus waveform. You know, they can calculate it, but I don't find that that's necessarily reproducible, and I want to train their eyes to look for those waveforms. Now, here I borrowed from an article from Ultrasound Clinics, and you can see that with increasing severity of disease, you can see that there's prolongation of that delay. So the first waveform is the normal one, the rapid systolic upstroke, perpendicular to the baseline. And as you get with, you know, with, with increasing stenosis, you start to see delay until it's finally completely rounded with a very tight stenosis. Okay, and here's just another example. Here's a patient with a celiac stenosis. The velocity is very high in the stenosis. And as I move it just a couple of millimeters downstream, you can see now it's, dis it's a disorganized flow pattern. The velocities have come right down. I've got a bi-directional signal with a shaggy pattern. Always look for that. Always make sure your sonographers continue to move the sample volume because if you get a borderline velocity, you know, say you're looking at a celiac and they give you 210. You know, it's right at the borderline. So you're not going to be sure. So you say, well, what's the velocity in the aorta? So you can compare it. Well, if that's 180, that's probably not a stenosis. But if they give you this really abnormal post stenotic waveform, then you say, oh, that probably is significant. Because look at the change in the flow pattern across that stenosis. That's the key. So let's start out by talking about the mesenterics. Now, patients who present to the ED with severe pain, you know, where you're concerned about acute occlusion, they're going to go for CT angiography typically in the ED. But it's the patients that we see that have chronic pain, you know, that's gone through multiple tests, they've had endoscopy, they've had CT scan, there's no diagnosis. They may even give you a history of not enjoying food or weight loss. Then those are the patients that have come to you for the mesenteric exam. And, you know, some will give you the classic history, some will just give you this history of chronic pain. Now, intestinal ischemia, you know, can have different etiologies. It could be related to arterial disease, it could be related to venous thrombosis, or just a low flow state. Now obviously if the patient's in the unit and you know, they're not doing well and they have abdominal pain, obviously you worry about shock, you worry about sepsis. Um, but typically what we're looking for is evidence of arterial stenosis, occlusion, or venous thrombosis. And we can do this on our sonographic exams. And in fact, the ACR appropriate criteria puts ultrasound right below CT angiography for these diagnoses on par with arteriography and MRA. Now, grayscale ultrasound is going to be nonspecific. You may see signs of bowel abnormalities. I think it's always important to look at the bowel. Is the bowel dilated? Is the bowel thick-walled? I mean, there's a lot of information that you can get just by looking at the bowel, even before you hit the color button, um, looking for ascites. Um, but you can improve and fine-tune your differential diagnosis by adding the Doppler, because if it's inflammatory bowel disease, if it's Crohn's disease, you'll see not only bowel thickening, but increased blood flow in the wall. If it's related to ischemia, you typically have decreased flow in, in a thick wall of the bowel. So there's a lot of ways to, to utilize it in these cases. For the mesenteric artery evaluation, we're typically going to look for abnormalities in blood flow, 
in all three vessels, the celiac, the SMA, the IMA, typically at dragging the sample volume from the aorta into the proximal portions of the vessels that we see. For the diagnosis of chronic mesenteric ischemia, we need to see abnormalities in at least two of the three vessels. One vessel usually is enough because there's so much collateral circulation that the patient compensates by having disease in only one vessel. So you need to see involvement in at least two of the three vessels to call it chronic mesenteric ischemia. Our protocol, again, we start out with the abdominal aorta, look for evidence of aneurysm, look for evidence of plaque, and then we start to take samples from the celiac SMA and IMA. Again, here are the normal waveforms. We mentioned before the aorta is going to be relatively low resistance at the origin of the celiac because it's supplying blood flow to the liver and the spleen. The celiac will also have low resistance flow pattern like the internal carotid, but the SMA is going to be very high resistance in the fasting state. If you have a low resistance SMA, that means there's either a significant abnormality at the origin of the vessel or the patient has really cheated and had breakfast or lunch before coming to see you which is usually the case. If you see a very low resistance pattern, you have to really push them. Did you really fast? And many times I'll say, well, you know, I only had coffee and toast today. I didn't have my, you know, my cereal and my waffles for breakfast. So to them, that's fasting, but that's not, usually, that's not the case. Normal velocity measurements, okay? So we said for the ICA, it's 60 to 100 centimeters per second, and we tend to be in the same range, maybe a little bit higher for the mesenteric arteries. So the celiac is about 100 centimeters per second, a little bit higher for the SMA and the IMA, which is why we have that higher cutoff of 275 for the SMA. So for a flow-reducing lesion, we say the velocity cutoffs are 200 for the celiac and the IMA, 275 from the SMA. That comes from work that was done long ago by Greg Mineta, uh, from the University of Oregon, and that work has, has, has held up. Now, I did some work looking at the IMA because I felt the IMA was neglected, and yet you can see the IMA. The IMA is not hard to find if you look for it. The way you find the IMA is by, you know, by going in a transverse plane down from the celiac I mean, and the SMA, and then you see the renals coming off, and if you continue down inferiorly, you'll see the IMA coming off to the left. It's right there. Um, and if there's significant mesenteric disease, the IMA is hypertrophied and even easier to see. And we came up with the velocity cutoff of 200 centimeters per second. So some years ago, we did a, a Doppler review of 205 patients trying to see which of the Doppler criteria worked the best in this examination. So we looked at the peak systolic velocity, we looked at the mesenteric aortic ratio, and we looked at the end diastolic velocity because these are the criteria that are out in the literature. And we found that the best measurement, as we would suspect, just like from our other Doppler studies, is the peak systolic velocity. It performs the best. Um, and that the ratio has, higher has a higher specificity, but then it has a sensitivity. So we start out with the velocity, and then we look at some of the other parameters that we talked about. And in terms of diagnosing chronic mesenteric ischemia, the peak systolic velocity performs the best, and we had a 93% uh, accuracy for that diagnosis. So these are the recommended criteria that we use, uh, which we've already mentioned. Look at the velocity, do the ratio in your head, and then look at the waveforms to see if there is a flow-reducing lesion there. And by combining these features, you should have a pretty high accuracy with this diagnosis. Color Doppler will show you the aliasing, the Bruy artifacts. The pulse Doppler will give you the high velocities, abnormal ratio, and the postenotic turbulence with the tardis parvus waveforms. Here's a 68-year-old presenting with abdominal pain. The celiac has a velocity of 131, so that's in the normal range. The SMA is elevated at 400. And here you can see the Bruy artifact right at the origin of the SMA. And then we go to the IMA, that velocity is also elevated. And you can see here the abnormal flow in the IMA compared to the aorta, which is in the normal range. So you have two vessel disease, it's classic chronic mesenteric ischemia. Now there are a number of pitfalls, just like with any study. And I already mentioned the postprandial state. You get higher velocities after patients eat because there's vasodilatation of the vessels to improve digestion. There's increased blood flow to the gut, just as you would expect. 
So that will increase the velocity, but that's why we have the patients fasting, and it also gives us a better acoustic window. Other things to think about, vessel tortuosity, aneurysmal dilatation, aortic stenosis, these will all be confounding elements. And there's ways to sort through all of these things. The one I want to focus on here is the median arcuate ligament syndrome. I'm sure most of you heard of this before. It's very common, particularly in our younger patients, younger women. This is something that is frequently seen if you look for it. This is caused by a leaflet of the diaphragm that compresses the celiac at expiration. You can see here on the MRA, the indentation that occurs across the top of the celiac near its origin, which obviously will elevate the velocity. But that's only seen in expiration. If you have the patient breathe normally or take in a breath, you see that that velocity is usually relieved and the velocities come back into the normal range. Patients get pain, probably not from the decreased flow, but from the nerve compression that occurs from the leaflet. And over time, you can get scarring in that area. And I've actually seen fixed defects in patients with median arcuate ligament, particularly in that, those older patients. And so going to surgery may not necessarily correct the abnormality. So we see elevated velocities in expiration or at rest, relieved with inspiration. Here's my fish, my fish hook appearance of the celiac. You can see it's tugged down, and you can appreciate that in real time. You could see the celiac being tugged down as the patient breathes out. And here's the examples, you know. With expiration, the velocity is 450, which you'd call a stenosis, but I have the patient taking a breath, and the velocities come all the way down to 176 centimeters per second. Other things to keep in mind, you sometimes you'll just pick up uh, another abnormality. Here's a case of a dissection. I've got a number of dissections in my collection. Most of them incidentally picked up. Now, some of them have had a dissection that were, was known uh, on a prior CT scan, usually an extension of a thoracic dissection that's moved into the abdomen. And sometimes they're picked up incidentally, as this case was. And here you can clearly see a dissection. Even if, you know, the best way to see the dissection is to turn the color off, and you can see the flap. But if you have the color on already, you can see that there's a double lumen there, and you could see the delayed fill-in of the false lumen in diastole. And here you can see pretty well on the CT scan. Uh, you can also evaluate patients post stent. I find Doppler is the best way to look at renal and mesenteric stents. They're very small. It's very hard to tell on MR, which sometimes has so much artifact, or on CT, the luminal reduction of a stent, whereas we actually can calculate the velocities pre and post stent. Um, and I'll show you again with, with renal stents. It's really easy to do if you, can, if you find the stent. And again, turning the color off, you can see the stent pretty well. And here again, comparing it to the other modalities can be very tough. And we're certainly not sending patients to angiography just to confirm patency of the stent. In my last few minutes, I'll talk a little bit about renal arterial disease. You know most commonly these patients are atherosclerotic. Every once in a while you get a patient that has another etiology, such as FMD. They can both produce hypertension and ischemic nephropathy. Our protocol, again, we look at the kidneys first, and then we look at the aorta. We get peak systolic velocity measurements from the renal arteries, and then we take waveforms from inside each kidney at the level of the segmental arteries to look at the waveforms. Looking at the kidney first, we look for evidence of atrophy, right, scarring, look for hydronephrosis, look for stones, and we look for masses. Here's a patient who has a large mass incidentally picked up from the upper pole of the right kidney. And what I do for those is to make sure that it's solid. I put the color on. I could see tumor vascularity within it. If it has high velocity flow, then I get concerned it's renal cell carcinoma, as was the case here, incidentally picked up. We do the direct examination of the renal arteries, getting samples origin, proximal, mid, and distal, making sure angle corrected, easy to review uh, from each side. And then we're going to take waveforms from the segmental branches inside the kidney to look for changes in the waveform that may suggest that there was an occult stenosis that we missed. And sometimes there are duplicated arteries, which you may not have picked up, may have a stenosis. You'll pick it up with the indirect exam. Or once, even less commonly, you can have a segmental artery stenosis you'll pick up with this test. So again, 
we talked about this earlier, turning the patient allows you to get the views that you can see the artery in the vein. Here's the left renal artery scanning through the kidney. That's our window. We see it in its entirety. The criteria for the renal exam, again, peak systolic velocity greater than 200, coupled with an elevated ratio. The renal aortic ratio has been around a long time, pretty well established, greater than 3.5, and looking at the hilo waveforms. Here's a stenosis in the proximal right renal artery. You can see the aliasing there. The velocity is almost 400. And you can see here the TARDIS waveforms inside the kidney. So it's, this is an easy one because everything's there. Same thing, here's the left renal artery. We see turbulence aliasing at the origin of the left. The velocity is over 700 centimeters per second, M more than three times the velocity in the aorta. Classic TARDIS parvus in the left kidney. And if, you compare, if you're not sure, you say, well, is that really TARDIS parvus? Bring up the right side. And the right side has a perfect upstroke with an early systolic compliance peak. See that little peak there? That you see in normal waveforms. So big difference between the waveforms when you're not sure if this TARDIS. Here's a patient with FMD, and we see it on this MRA involving the iliacs. There's, the, you can see the beaded appearance. And we also had FMD in the renal artery. Again, FMD occurs in younger patients. It occurs in the mid and distal portions of the artery, unlike atherosclerosis, which likes the origin. So when you have a younger patient, hypertension, want to when you want to evaluate for renal vascular disease, you need to make sure you see the whole artery really well. And here we have another example of FMD, mid portion of the vessel, elevated velocities there. Uh, looking at our series, we again found that, like the carotids, complementary uh, findings, the peak systolic velocity, very sensitive. The ratio, very specific. TARDIS waveforms, not very sensitive. We do not rely on the indirect exam. But when you see them, very specific. So by incorporating this information, you can have pretty high accuracy. People mention the resistive index. I usually don't, because if you, it's like flipping a coin. The resistive index plays no part in trying to determine if the patient has an underlying stenosis. I mentioned about the value in renal stents. Obviously, we can see through the stent, see the high velocities before and after successful stent placement. Also, you can also assess the high low waveforms. Here, they're abnormal pre-stent, and they go back to a normal appearance after successful stenting. In our study, we came up with a peak systolic velocity of 240 and a ratio of 3.2 to evaluate for instant restenosis in our renal arteries. Finally, in my last minute or so, other things, there's lots of other things we, we see incidentally in the kidneys. We can see aneurysms. We can see occlusion. We can see pseudoaneurysms. And like I mentioned before, we can see tumors. So that's why we include an evaluation of the kidney when we look at the vessels. Here's a patient that has a renal artery occlusion. The kidney is small. It's atrophic. You can see there's barely any parenchyma surrounding the echogenic hilum. Um, we just see a nubbin at the origin of the right renal artery. You don't see the artery at all. Correlating very well with the MRA. And you may see flow inside the kidney. But if you do see flow inside a kidney with an occluded artery, it's typically very abnormal, very low velocity, in a very rounded appearance, because this flow is coming in via collaterals. Here's an example of a renal artery aneurysm with the angiographic correlation. Uh, not very common, but you will see them once in a while. Uh, they occur more often in women than men, typically middle age. 90% of them are extra renal. They can be, tr usually the true aneurysms are related to some connective tissue disease like Ellis Danlos. And you typically wait for two to three centimeters before considering intervention. And one thing we tend to pick up once in a while, patients who present with back pain, or hematuria, we may pick up infarcts. Here was a patient that had a history of atrial fibrillation, developed hematuria and pain, and you can see very nicely the wedge-shaped defect in the upper pole on the power Doppler study. Again, live, a bunch of cases like this, patient went on to have a CT scan just to confirm the wedge-shaped abnormality on the right side. 
So I'm going to conclude the presentation by saying we do have a number of different techniques that we can use to evaluate the vessels, ultrasound, CT, NGO, MR. We've had a very high success rate with ultrasound. The, adva the advantage of Doppler is that it determines the hemodynamic significance of a lesion that we see. It's not just a morphologic test. By assessing the postdenotic signals, we can tell that it is indeed flow reducing. We've had the best results by combining both the direct and the indirect examination. And of course, you know, making sure that you train your techs um, to look for all these things will improve uh, their experience and your diagnostic accuracy. 